Sean Garrett Rowe. I'm in the Department of Chemistry here. Uh, I'd like to tell you about a collaboration that's really been fostered by the PQI. So this is something that uh, really I'd like to thank uh, everyone here at the PQI who, who uh, makes this such a stimulating environment. It's really given us a chance to uh, establish and run with a collaboration. My laboratory is an experimental laboratory using ultra-fast spectroscopy to try to understand the dynamics of molecules in the condensed phase. Uh, one way of thinking about what we're doing is we're using short pulses of light to make movies of molecules as they move around. The folks who've done the work here and, and really deserve all of the thanks, uh, Tom Brinzer has done the experiments, and uh, we've had a very active collaboration, especially with Eric Berquist uh, and uh, in the group of Daniel Lambrecht that you heard from earlier this morning. Uh, also very active in this has been Clyde Daly, a graduate student in the group of Steve Corselli over at Notre Dame. So we do the experiments. Uh, the quantum chemistry is coming from Eric and Daniel, and then uh, Steve and Clyde are doing classical molecular dynamics simulations. And it's the union of all of these three different sets of tools that are letting us to really get a deep insight into what's going on here. And again, I really want to recognize uh, the PQI for supporting this research. So from the big picture perspective, what are we interested in? One of these topics is uh, there's a societal need to have better tools for capturing CO2 from large point emitters. Uh, there are technologies for doing that. They're based on molecules such as ethanolamines. And for a variety of reasons, they're too expensive and no one is using them. A lot of new materials are being introduced that could help to solve this problem. One of those materials is based on ionic liquids. There are a variety of other uh, materials out there as well. But if you want to optimize any one of these materials, you need to know in detail how does CO2 interact with its surroundings such that you could tune not only the thermodynamics of adsorption as well as the dynamics and transport properties of CO2 in these uh, materials. So our role as a spectroscopist is to go and provide really molecular details in terms of how does CO2 interact with its surroundings, what are the dynamics, and how can we understand the intermolecular interactions that are dictating the macroscopic properties. So we're developing the spectroscopic tools in the context of these ionic liquids with the prospect of expanding them to uh, other materials in the future. So just, this is a very broad audience, what is an ionic liquid? An ionic liquid is a room temperature molten salt. So let's start with sodium chloride. Good old table salt has a melting temperature around 800 degrees C. So heated above its melting temperature, it loses translational periodicity, it becomes a liquid composed of cations and anions. It's an ionic liquid. There's a group of organic salts that have melting temperatures around room temperature. So they are liquids composed of cations and anions with no excess solvent that um, are liquid at room temperature. Uh, unlike sodium chloride, these are very interesting for chemical processes, such as separations, reaction media, and, a, and energy storage. They are interesting for these practical applications because they have things such as very high vapor pressures and very wide uh, electrochemical windows. They're also interesting from a fundamental perspective of these are very complex fluids. There are a variety of intermolecular interactions. The geometry of these molecules are very complicated. And all of those effects add up to make it so that it's very difficult to predict how will a small change in molecular structure change the macroscopic properties. There can be large and unintuitive effects based on very small modifications. So we envision spectroscopy as working to under unravel the molecular details here, interfacing on the one side with the people who are developing ionic liquids for particular applications, meaning we also try to work with people who are making molecules. On the other side, we're trying to provide uh, detailed spectroscopic observables for those groups trying to understand, uh, build theoretical understanding of the types of interactions in the condensed phase, i.e. working with people who are making models. And it's between these two groups that we, uh, of researchers that we find ion, uh, spectroscopy to be a very uh, useful endeavor. Overall in my group, the, the long range plan of my group is investigating a variety of aspects of structure and dynamics in these ionic liquids. Uh, we've been investigating where, how does, say, hydrogen bonding turn into macroscopic properties such as the viscosity of the ionic liquids? And viscosity is a key macroscopic property for understanding uh, the transport properties. And this is one of the most important macroscopic parameters to optimize for taking ionic liquids and really scaling them up into uh, uh, real applications. Uh, we've also done a great deal of work in understanding how uh, ionic liquids are 
uh, tuning the reactivity of certain reactive groups such as azides. But the story that I really want to focus on has to do with carbon capture, how CO2 is interacting with these ionic liquids. Our basic strategy for investigating this question is to use the CO2 molecule and its vibrations as a probe of how it interacts with the ionic liquid. Right? So CO2 has a variety of intramolecular modes, the symmetric stretch, a doubly degenerate bend, and this anti-symmetric stretch. This is the optically active transition that we'll be using. We'll follow transitions of the anti-symmetric stretch of CO2 to see how it's interacting with its environment. So we're interested, uh, as you'll see throughout the talk, there are these intramolecular modes and how CO2 is coupled uh, to also the intermolecular motions, the low frequency modes that are coming from structural reorganization of the liquid around the CO2 molecule. So we've published uh, on this and, and done some work that I described to you, I think, in the PQI last year. We'll summarize that real fast. First, CO2 has a solvatochromic shift. That means this anti-symmetric stretch of CO2 is sensitive to the nature of the anion in the ionic liquid. Change the anion, and the vibrational frequency of the CO2 changes. The origin of this change has to do with charge transfer. And Daniel started to introduce this uh, idea to you earlier using something like a decomposition technique based on this ALMO EDA. You can say, what are the different contributions to this vibrational frequency? What physical effect causes the frequency to change? And it's this chain of events. Charge transfer causes the geometry to change, and the geometry is dictating the vibrational frequency. Uh, our experiments in the ultrafast lab have shown that you can measure dynamics on a picosecond time scale, and that those dynamics really change very strongly as you change the anion in the ionic liquid. You can change the dynamic time scales by an order of magnitude based on the, uh, which particular ionic liquid you're looking at. And we understand that as being the dynamics of the CO2 are gated by the motions of the anion. What I mean is, if you look at the dynamical time scales we extract from our measurement and the bulk viscosity of the fluid, you see a strong correlation that says, the motions, the molecular motions that cause viscosity, diffusional motion in the ionic liquid, those seem to be strongly related to the types of motions that allow a CO2 to change its local environment. Those two types of motions are coupled, right? They seem to be strongly related to each other. But to go further in terms of the research of understanding how CO2 is uh, um, solvated in these ionic liquids, uh, it's really necessary to have uh, our experiments on a strong theoretical foundation. And here's where this collaboration with the Lambrecht group and the Corselli group has really come into play. So I want to highlight some features to you uh, that are in our spectra that, need, that are asking for a deep interpretation. Uh, the first one that I'll be talking about is, so here is, for example, a 2D IR spectrum. Let's look at a few of the features in this spectrum, and they'll indicate some of the phenomena that need explanation. So in a 2D IR experiment, 2D IR is a coherent vibrational spectroscopy. It's most analogous to a 2D NMR experiment. Right? So we have a, an excitation frequency where we're able to excite vibrations in our molecules. And then there is a f another set of pulses in our, laser, in our uh, pulse sequence that are able to read out the vibrational frequency of a molecule. And there's a time delay in between those two that we're able to control. When that time delay is very short, we'll, we can see a certain set of patterns. This is an absorption spectrum for this molecule in two dimensions. So as we change the time delay, there are some things that change. Let's look at this peak right here. You'll see that at short times, it's stretched out along this diagonal line. And at long times, it becomes very round in shape. That's the first kind of feature that we need to understand. A second type of feature is you'll see that there are a series of peaks in our spectrum. If you zoom in along the z-axis, you can see that these peaks are, are not noise at all. These are really well-defined peaks. And that as a function of time, you get cross peaks that grow in uh, between our peaks here. So the change in cross peaks is a feature that we want to understand. And then there are also a few other features in here that I would say are unexpected absorption processes. Um, these two sets of, uh, these two parts of the story, I'll actually have to pass them on uh, to Tom Brinzer. He has a poster uh, and he'll be happy to tell you all about uh, these two parts of the story. I want to really zoom in on this one part of the story right here, which is about uh, why does the line shape of the diagonal feature in our 2D IR spectrum change as a function of time. The qualitative picture for that is well understood, which is to say, if you have a molecule, uh, its vibrational frequency depends on its local environment. 
So you could have a molecule here with a certain solvation shell, and it'll have a certain vibrational frequency. Uh, other molecules in other environments will have different vibrational frequencies. So when we do our 2D IR pulse sequence, uh, if the time delay is very short, then our initial and final frequencies are very correlated to each other. Nothing has time to move around. So the, we basically spread out the ensemble of molecules along the diagonal of the spectrum. As we increase the amount of time in our pulse sequence, molecular diffusion causes the vibrational frequencies to change. So the shape in our spectra become uncorrelated. They lose memory of where they began. So this process is called spectral diffusion. I'll also throw in here, the, I'll be talking, you will see in the spectra, there are blue peaks and there are red peaks. Uh, the blue peaks are coming from transitions. The difference between these is uh, how they walk up and down the vibrational ladder of states. The blue peaks correspond to transitions only between the vehicle zero and vehicles one state with our different pulses of light. And the red is walking up the ladder of states. So we know what both of these are. These highlight some of the quantum mechanical processes that are happening on the intramolecular scale. Now, to really understand what a CO2 molecule is doing uh, in an ionic liquid, in principle, the thing we need to do is understand the full, both electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom, uh, treating both nuclei and electrons quantum mechanically for the molecule and the whole box of solvent around it. That is clearly a computationally infeasible task. There are a variety of ways of, uh, ways of trying to decompose, to simplify that problem, to separate a molecule and it's intramolecular degrees of freedom, a quantum part from a classical bath that surrounds it. There are a variety of different ways of doing that, and I wanna place what we're doing in a particular context so that it's clear. So first, you can try to really treat the nuclear wave function uh, and propagate it through some non-equilibrium process. This is extraordinarily expensive, and you can do it only with the fewest degrees of freedom. I I've seen, for example, treating one hydrogen, which is effectively three degrees of freedom. It's really a, an extremely computationally difficult process. There's a very active area of research of developing approximate nuclear dynamics based on path integral methods, and a variety of different uh, approaches are present um, in the literature. You can just hope that running classical dynamics on either an ab initio or empirical potential will somehow be capturing the essential frequencies that you want to have in your spectrum. And so this is a very common approach. There's a, a I think a, an approach that's unique is trying to take classical simulations and then uh, run them through a certain mathematical formalism that will allow you to correct them to make them quantum response functions from a purely classical trajectory. So this is, let's say, the scholarly context in which are doing, we're doing our approach. The approach we're using is different still. What we'll do is uh, we'll take a classical trajectory from classical molecular dynamics simulations and then in a post-processing step, dress it with a quantum mechanical description of, for example, our CO2 molecule. And that general variety of approaches is what we call developing a spectroscopic map. And this has been very useful for the 2D IR spectroscopy community to describe the dynamics of many molecules in the condensed phase. Water, amides, so peptides and proteins, as well as a variety of other molecules as well. Here's a, a quick, uh, 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 sampling of the researchers who's, who've been very important in that. So here's the overall roadmap for this type of a treatment. You run a molecular dynamic simulation. This is a purely classical simulation because you need really long times in order to sample all of the types of solvent configurations that are available. Then taking snapshots from the simulation, you run high level quantum chemistry to understand what would be the vibrational frequency of a molecule in those different snapshots. So our CO2 molecule, what would its vibrational frequency be? But you only do that for a very small subset of the snapshots from the trajectory. But based on that small subset, you can develop some kind of empirical mapping. Okay, if you know the forces and electric fields and Leonard-Jones forces of that are present in your MD simulation, maybe you could find a lookup table or some way of empirically mapping the coordinates of an MD simulation to the quantum mechanical properties. Based on that map, you can then uh, have a cheap and fast, quick and dirty way of calculating spectroscopic observables that you can then plug into um, uh, nonlinear response formalism so that you can calculate 2D spectra. So 
with this roadmap in mind, we set off on first validating the quantum chemistry that we're using. Uh, so for example, we're doing taking a cluster out of an MD simulation, treating part of it quantum mechanically and treating the rest as a polarizing uh, point charges, for example. And uh, Eric has shown that as you increase the size of the quantum mechanical region, we're getting nice convergence uh, to some converged values. Treating six pairs, that's one and a half to two solvation shells. That's actually too expensive for us. So to calculate for that number of snapshots, you can do only some tens of snapshots. So really, we'll be basing our uh, analysis on using two pairs of uh, cations and anions, but that's highly correlated with the converged results, there's just a small systematic error, a small shift. And we've checked that converged, the, as you increase the size of the molecular mechanics region, again, our results are going to a converged value. Then a very important point of comparison is to say, the quantum chemistry that we're doing, uh, is it converged with respect to, uh, is this result really general for multiple methods, or is it something only showing up in one method? So Eric tested a variety of flavors of density functional theory and wave function theory with different basis sets. And the picture is, is that the re results are very robust. Uh, there are only quantitative changes, and the qualitative trends here, if you look at different snapshots ordered by the vibrational frequencies, you'll see the overall trends and distributions look very similar, only with small shifts in the mean values. So with that set of quantum mechanical results uh, in hand, we then set about calculating anharmonic vibrational frequencies. And here's, so we, we've got our snapshots. Uh, then we treat the two different CO stretches as different local modes, and we calculate, thank you, uh, a potential energy surface, uh, use a DVR method to solve the nuclear quantum mechanics here. We can test uh, a function that looks like this one, so we can fit the parameters of this curve like this to several different important features that when you put them together are able to reproduce the frequencies uh, from our map, reproduce the DVR results, and then you can test that on an independent set of samples and you find that the two are strongly correlated. And so this spectroscopic, spectroscopic map that we've developed is really new. It contains new insight into how this molecule is solvated. All of the other spectroscopic maps that exist are only electrostatic in nature. They need an electric field or an electric field gradient. And that's not enough information to understand how CO2 is solvated. You need uh, electric fields, yes, but you also need things that look like Leonard-Jones parameters, Leonard-Jones forces on the CO2 molecule. And the Lambrecht group has uh, been able to show us through a SAPT calculation that these Leonard-Jones forces are picking up both real dispersion terms and the repulsive part of the Leonard-Jones is picking up Pauli repulsion. So it's the steric overlap of, say, for example, the alkyl chains. Uh, and then how many degrees of freedom of the intramolecular modes you keep has also a big effect on our results. And the takeaway point here is that the external dynamics you capture correctly when you treat only the two internal degrees of freedom, the CO stretches, and keep the bend frozen. So with that in mind, we have now a, for, um, a method for calculating dynamics of CO2 in the condensed phase. And we see that the vibrational frequency fluctuation correlation functions that we get from our measurement are dominated by the interactions with the anode ions, and that those interactions are coming from both electrostatic forces that deal with the long-term tails, as well as short-range interactions that are uh, happening on faster timescales. So with that, I'd really better stop for the sake of time. I'll say thank you very much, and thanks go to the uh, folks who did all of the work. Again, Tom Brinzer and Eric Berquist and Clyde, uh, who's at the University of Notre Dame. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.